if it's stony there's obviously going to be rocks close to the surface so you've got to keep all these sort of things in mind and if you're riding in the forest you've got to be keeping an eye open for sticks and logs about the floor you know because unless you've seen it before you come to it it's surely going to bring you on Nid yn unig gyda'r ddaear mae problemau, o fewn pedair awr o'r hugain i'r sgwrs na trochi nebu geraint. Mae Cof wedi rhoi'r gorau i gynhyrchu. Mae ffatri enwog yr Almaen wedi dioddef gan dacteg dympio'r siapaniaid, a olygau fod beiciau mae Cof yn ddwy waith pris rhai eu cystadlewyr. Mae hi'n ergyd drom i geraint y gareth, wedi treulio'r holl amser yn perthaethio'r mae Cof mewn cannoedd y cystadlaethau. Germany, 1926. A small 24-hour automobile repair shop was opened by Ulrich Meisch. The shop was called Meisch & Company, where he, along with his two sons, Otto and Wilhelm, repaired automobiles as well as sold bicycle and motorcycle parts. In the early 1930s, Otto and Wilhelm decided to build complete bicycles. Here is an old bicycle parts catalog from that era. By the mid-1930s, their brothers were building their own motorcycles using ELO and Saks engines, as can be seen here in these early models. Also during this time, the name of the company was also shortened to Maiko, which is a combination of M-A-I from Maish and C-O from the word company. A man riding a motorcycle as part of the name was also incorporated into a logo. New legislation in Germany in the late 1930s allowed for motorcycles up to 200cc to be tax-free. This was the perfect opportunity for Mako, which was using the 118cc ELO and 98cc Sax engines. Mako built a new factory in Pafang in 1939. World War II breaks out and Germany nationalizes many companies to produce raw materials. Mako, BMW, Porsche, and Mercedes are manufacturing airplane components and materials for the Luftwaffe. Wilhelm Mahesh became a member of Germany's National Socialist Party while Otto remained outside of politics. Otto would take control of the company post-World War II due to post-war laws that prohibited former Nazi Party members from owning controlling shares in German industry. It is not known why Wilhelm joined the Nazi Party. Some speculate it was a way to keep the business in the family by hedging their bets no matter the outcome of the war. Either way, the business was kept in the family even if by accident. <laughs> After World War II, Mako initially was running as a repair shop business in their West German location, but everything changed in 1948 when the new Deutschmark was introduced. There was now a new, increased demand for small motorcycles, and Mako was poised to jump back into motorcycle development. This time, they developed a completely new motorcycle, including their first two-stroke engine designed by Will Teslaff. This was a 1948 Mako M125. In order to satisfy customer needs, which were more focused on reliability and durability than power, Mako became an advocate of the new sports of trials, enduro, and distance endurance testing. Mako would go to these events and promote test trials of their products. The Mako M125 was not a good seller, but this was followed up by the Mako M150 in 1949. By 1950, Mako had three works riders, including the hiring of legendary six-stage rider Ulrich Pohl as chief engineer. Orwich used his extensive experience and completely redesigned the frame, engine, and suspension leading to a more successful product, the Mako M175. In 1952, the Mako M175 captured six gold medals in the 1952 ISDT. Mako sold as many M175s as it could produce with the international recognition that it received. In 1950, Mako sold 5,600 units. In 1951, they sold 8,900 units. And this almost tripled in 1952, with 26,700 units being sold. By 1953, Mako was selling more than 100 motorcycles per day. 
This is a photo from the 1952 ICT of the Mako Six Days team. From left to right, we have the six gold medalists. Ludwig Westphal, Gottlieb Haas, Gunther Egensten, Chief Mako Engineer, Ulrich Pohl, Walter Achtum, Hans Danger, whom all rode the Mako M175. The number 77 is the Mako of Gottlieb Haas, the number 65 is the Mako of Ulrich Pohl. In 1951, Mako also started to manufacture scooters, as these were popular alternatives to those who could not afford cars. The first Mako scooter was the Mako Mobile, which was similar to a motorcycle with an enclosed body. This was followed up by a much more luxurious model in 1955 called the Mako Letta. This was Mako's response to the new slick designs coming out of Italy with the likes of Vespa and Lambretta. The Mekoletta was the most successful German scooter of its time, being developed until 1968. The Mekomobile was discontinued after 1958. Even the Mekoletta was winning races. As one of the most powerful scooters available, it was very popular among enthusiasts. Meko started the design and development of road bikes as well. The first road bike was in 1953 called the Meko Typhoon. As they named these bikes after winds, the second bike in 1955 was called the Meko Blizzard. Here is a 1950s German commercial on the Mako Blizzard with the added English subtitles. You will notice how they acknowledge their efforts in testing their bikes in endurance competitions. Im internationalen Zuverlässigkeitssport liegen seit Jahren Maiko Motorräder an der Spitze. Diese normalen Serienmaschinen unter den härtesten Bedingungen erprobt, halten im Stadtverkehr mit ihrem enormen Anzugsvermögen diese Spitze ebenso wie auf langen Strecken mit hohem Reisdurchschnitt. Wunderbar bequem, trotz der hohen Geschwindigkeit. Das ist bei der Maiko Blitzab selbstverständlich. Vorne schwinge, hinten schwinge. Wie ein Brett liegt die Maschine auf der Straße. Aber noch wichtiger, trotz ihrer 14,5 PS ist diese 250 Kubikzentimeter Maschine sehr sparsam im Verbrauch. Schnell, komfortabel, einer der großartigsten deutschen Zweitakter. Und deshalb fahren viele nur noch Maiko. In the mid-1950s, Mako decided to try and diversify beyond two-wheeled machines and into manufacturing of cars, microcars to be specific. They purchased Champion in 1955 and displayed their first two models at the 1955 Frankfurt show with the Mako MC400 and the Mako MC403. The first two years, they were met with success and they produced 3,873 cars. They would later build the Mako 500 Sport. Mako microcars were shown at various shows all over Europe and eventually at New York since they wanted to enter the American market. They teamed up with American importer Weezer International. However, they had issues with payments coming from the U.S. and this caused a stir with the local banks in Germany. By 1957 to 58, the banks had started bankruptcy proceedings on Mako, which landed Otto in jail for 20 months and Wilhelm suffered a serious heart attack. There were also several company associates who were also jailed or fined. Sales were lacking. And by mid-1958, Mako returned solely to, to motorcycle production. An estimated total of 6,000 cars were produced. <laughs> Another strategy struck Mako in 1958 when Wilhelm was watching a motorcycle event and he was struck by two motorcycles permanently paralyzing him. He became no more than a figurehead in the company as Ota would now be running the day-to-day -day operations. Overall, Mako did thrive in the 1950s, establishing their motorcycles as reliable and durable and long-endurance ICT events. Mako became synonymous with high-quality German enduro and motocross motorcycles. It was also during this time that competitors would take notice and start to imitate and copy Mako's designs. One such design was the Bazooka Fork designed originally for the Mako Letta, that offered such stability and great handling that it was even incorporated into their off-road and motocross models. It was this attention to detail in engineering and quality that was starting to become recognized and attributed to the Mako name. They were departing from engineering norms, incorporating new technologies, and constantly in pursuit of building the best performing machines they could. Aside from the Enduro and ISET wins, they were also winning in motocross. Frederick Gorge Betzlatcher was the 1957 European 250 motocross champion on a Mako, for example. In the Catalina Grand Prix, not only would Johnny Seabrandt claim victory, but 
most of the top spots would also be held by a Mako. In an interview with road racer and engineer Eric Blay, he recalled that Mako was a little bit better than what competitors such as BMW were offering in the 1950s. Motorcycle sales in Germany were slumping in the late 1950s, and this was one of the reasons that Mako tried to diversify with microcars unsuccessfully, which led to Mako's first bankruptcy in 1958. However, leading into the 1960s, Mako would find a way to recover. Mako was the only European company that was building off-road motorcycles from the ground up. While most were starting with road bikes and turning them into off-road bikes, Mako was engineering them from the beginning as off-road. In 1959, the newly formed West German Army approached Mako and was provided a prototype of what would later become the M250B. This was based on the Mako Blizzard, and the Army would test it against many competitors, but it would prove to be far superior. This helped boost Mako at the start of the 1960s when the Army ordered 10,000 units. Mako developed the only front steering dirt bike in the world for nearly two decades. Leading front axle forks combined with upper tubes mounted in the triple tree nearly in line with the steering stem. This lessened the mechanical advantage of the front wheel in favor of the rider's strength. Mako was also distributing worldwide, not only motorcycles, but thousands of mini bike and go kart engines as well into the United States. More transformations would come over this decade as they would switch from the oval barrel design to the square barrel design in the late 1960s. Mako continued to win championships and promote success stories like Herbert Schlick. Herbert started out in the mid-1950s with German Enduro National Championships on an Austrian pooch. The machine failures kept him from ever winning the championship until 1962 when he switched over to Mako. This was his first year out on the Mako and he won the 1962 250cc title. He would deliver a total of six championships to Mako. By the end of the 1960s, Mako was producing the finest off-road motorcycles you could buy. In 1963, Mako decided to offset dwindling sales of its scooters by venturing into street motorcycles. Mako was previously not doing much in terms of street motorcycles as their main focus had always been off-road. This led to the development of their first two bikes, the MD50 and 125, both of which featured a new rotary valve design. By 1966, Mako got serious and hired Gunther Scheer as chief engineer and three factory racers, Gunther Fischer, Dieter Braun, and Tony Gruber. They also announced they would now be competing in the 125, 250, and 350cc classes. Their first success was Tony Gruber finishing second place in a 350cc class on a 252cc Mako at the German Championship in Nürburgring. Mako did very well in road racing and their machines became very popular as Dieter Braun would eventually become 125cc world champion. Mako would continue road racing into the 1970s. Upon retirement, motocross racer Brian Kenny, who was riding for Mako, would even race a Mako road bike at Daytona. Mako had made motocross bikes, street bikes, scooters, trials bikes, enduro bikes, road bikes, and even grass trackers. Given the variety of bikes you find developed as Makos, it's never surprising to find an oddball special purpose built bike here or there, like this bike. This is the Mako Motoball bike, built in 1963. Motoball is kind of a sport like soccer, except you ride around on motorcycles. As you can see, it was specially built to keep the exhaust high and with a bar around the bottom of the engine to catch the ball away from the frame. By the 1970s, Mako had accumulated over 150 world championships in motorcycle racing. They were looked upon favorably as BMW or Mercedes. In 1972, Mako lent motorcycles to escort the Olympic torch runners for the Munich Games. This is the era that defined Mako as it is most remembered today. So much history here that we can really only go through and find the highlights. Mako is still building road racing and street bikes, as well as even mopeds and scooters into the 1980s, but they are most remembered in this era for motocross. Although most remembered for motocross, they had a great enduro and ISCT following in Europe. In fact, the Mako 440 was a dominant machine in English enduros, with Garrett Jones being 10 times British enduro champion. The last year, the 500 class was featured in Supercross, and Daytona 1975 was run by Steve Stackable on a Mako 500. So Mako won the last 500cc Supercross. 
The major appeal of Mako is the fact that it was a small company. They were willing to try anything, and any builder who had an idea could get support from Mako, as many did. Unlike the big Japanese companies, who developed separate expensive works bikes that were unlike the public offering, the bikes Mako raced were the same they sold to the public. One of the most famous motocross riders of the early 1970s was Ake Johnson. Ake won motocross as nations on a Mako in 1970 and 1971. He almost made world champion in 1971 as well, but a spark plug came out of his engine during the race, and so he finished in second place. The big controversy, however, came in 1972, when he won the Trans AMA Championship on a Mako against tough competitors such as Brad Lackey and Roger DeCoster. He dominated, providing with nine consecutive overall wins, a feat that was never equaled. The controversy was over his Mako, since the factory claimed it was stock, and yet it went against Suzuki's Joel Robert and Roger DeCoster were competing on the Super Light Works 370, Yamaha was using the YZ360 work spike in a new YZ500. Kawasaki's Brad Lackey was on a new Prototype 400. So it was not believable that a stock Mako 400 was beating these work spike week after week. Two magazines, which were Popular Cycling Magazine and Motorcyclist Magazine, were allowed to disassemble the bike. And both magazines concluded the bike was stock. Some of the riders associated with Mako in the 1970s were Ake Johnson, Adolf Well, Willie Barr, Hans Maish, Tim Hart, Gary Chaplin, Rex Staten, Rich Erstedt, Steve Stackable, Galam Mosier, Denny Swartz, and Denny Magoo Chandler. <laughs> One of the biggest innovations to offer off motorcycles from Mako came in 1973 when Mako race team engineer Reinhold Ware mounted the rear shocks on his works bikes such that they moved forward, and this became known as long travel suspension. This gave such an advantage to Mako riders that rivals were frantically chopping up their frames to remain competitive. Mako released these into production in 1974 and a half models. In the mid-1970s, Mako went from square barrel to what is known as radial fins. The radial fin design is actually patented by Mako. Over the years, Mako actually filed a number of patents to protect their intellectual property, although that didn't stop others from copying. Roger DeCoster himself admitted in an interview that Mako seemed to be doing well, so they copied Mako's boring stroke. In fact, RM Pistons will even work in Mako's. When Brad Lackey retired, he started racing vintage motocross on a Mako, and he said if he had one of these bikes back in the day, he would have been world champion a whole lot earlier. In the late 1970s, Egbert Haas built his own Mako 750 out of a Mako 504 to enter into the 1979 ISTT. He won that race, and he was later quoted as saying that BMW had invested millions into their machine, and he may do with his own build. 50% of Mako sales were in North America during this time, and Mako dominated the high-end off-road motorcycle market in America. It had been stated that for open-class races, Mako made up half or more of the entries. <laughs> In 1980, Yamaha released the YZ465, which took away ground from the previously dominant Mako 440. Mako responded in 1981 by developing the 1981 Mako 490, which is known as the greatest dirt bike of all time, and has been used as a yardstick time and time again to measure the performance of newer machines. A few examples are when ADB magazine compared a 1981 Mako 490 against a 2003 KTM 525, and the Mako won the drag race by a bike length. In 1991, Dirt Bike Rider magazine compared it against a 1991 Honda CR500, in which they claimed the bikes are fairly equal in a drag race. Selvarji Narya, who was a former Mako employee and for 20 years vice president of KTM, said the Mako engineers produced the basic geometry and layout for every modern dirt bike with the introduction of the Great 490. 
In fact, you can see this in modern bikes by overlaying them on top of the Maker 490 and see how eerily close they actually are. In 1981, Mako sold more 490s than Honda did in the entire motorcycle lineup. Australian legend Jeff Ballard, who used to jump Makos through fire, had this to say about the 1981 Mako 490. Generally, um, you know, the Makos had terrible brakes uh, and, you know, fantastic steering and general handling, especially at the time. But even nowadays, I find that you on the right track, like a grass track, and probably go just about as quick, you know, as a modern bike. It's very, very close. In fact, possibly quicker. So what was legendary about the Mako was the way they delivered the power. They had a lot of power, but they also delivered it really well, and it and it uh, put a lot of it to the ground and it runs Mako may not go that was always a saying you know people would Mako break oh there was all these things and they were a real finicky bike uh, you had to know they were pretty reliable to be honest but you just had to know what you had to keep on top of and maintenance and things like that but the 1981 Mako 490 delivered the power to the ground had excellent handling and it did all this using less than modern methods there were no reeds the engine used primary chains in place of straight cut gears Instead of a round shifting cam, they saved weight by using a shifting plate, and that provided for very smooth and easy shifting. Makos were still air-cold and twin shock. In 1982, Makos started their progress to a more modern design with the incorporation of a monoshock. There were problems, though. The monoshock was designed by Cordain Caso, who designed shocks for Ferrari but was not familiar with dirt bikes. These shocks could overextend and break. Mako had to pay warranties that the broken shocks replaced with Olin's that cost double the original shock. In 1983, Mako completely redesigned with a new engine. This engine had a revalve intake, the primary chain was gone in place of straight cut gears, and a traditional gearbox with a shifting cam was introduced. The result was a phenomenal powerhouse that upon test ride was said to be a freight train on nitrous oxide. <laughs> However, more problems occurred. Gearboxes broke and rear hub shattered. Mako was forced to pay more royalties until eventually David Dion Scott, a racer from Virginia, became paralyzed when a rear hub exploded. In 1983, Mako went bankrupt. But what happened? Well, as most people who have read the famous article by Super Hunky know that the sons of Wilhelm Sr., who were Peter, Hans, and Wilhelm Jr., had performed an internal takeover. They did so by using incorrect materials for the gearboxes and proper heat treatments. These allegations came to light when the company was up for sale in 1987 and internal memos were leaked. Oto Mahesh himself was quoted in 1991 Mako Writers Club magazine stating that this bankruptcy came at the hands of his nephews. During the bankruptcy procedures in 1984, they were able to acquire the company for a fraction of what it was worth. Oto's daughter still controlled Mako USA, and try as they did, they were unable to secure the Mako name in the United States. This is a photo of the last time a Mako was in Supercross. This is the Vancouver Supercross race at BC Palace Stadium, 1983, and the rider is Eric Eaton. The brothers were now properly heat treating engines, and they needed to get into the U.S. market. They struck a deal with Ted Lapidus, as mentioned in Psycho News, February 29th, 1984. They took the gearbox to the University of Stuttgart to have it tested and prove the gearbox issues had been fixed. The new gearbox design in 1984 included the use of needle bearings on the gears, whereas the 1983 engine used brass bushings. In order to get around the Mako name in the U.S., bikes imported where the clutch case name grinded off. The manuals would black out the Mako name, and the company was called GM Star, stood for Maish Brothers in German, or simply M Star. Several issues plagued the brothers, the first of which was being completely unfamiliar with the Mako market. They upgraded the 250 with water cooling, which did not sell as well as their open-class models. They changed the name of the 500 to Supercross, a race in which the 500 did not even compete. 
1986, they hired Bert von Zitwitz, Rolf Diffenbach, Leif Nickerson, and Colin Dugmore. They produced 1,500 machines this year and only 1,100 sold. In 1987, they could no longer produce any more motorcycles. Peter and Hans were totally demoralized, and Wilhelm was admitted to a psychiatric facility. They took to sell the company, and it was ultimately sold to Lorenz Merkel, whose family owns an industrial factory for the last 80 years. Lorenz buys it in order to keep Mako German. It takes until 1989 to move all the materials to Merkel's factory in Bavaria. A lot of people think that Merkel was the reason that Mako went blue. The real reason was Bill Brown from the UK. In 1985, he visited the factory to see the 86 models. He loved the bikes and all the improvements, but he was disappointed that they looked like the same old bikes from previous years. The factory had already decided that red was the official color, and so Bill ordered the bikes without plastics, and he bought his own blue plastics. And this is why they were blue in the UK and red in the United States. Initially, Merkel teams up with Frederick Zabel and releases a new generation of engines. This partnership only lasts for six months, and Merkel is on his own. In 1990, he now offers intermediate machines of 320 and 380. Bill Brown sends an English technician to help him with engineering. 300 motorcycles are built in 1991. In 1992, Merkel starts development on a new 440 engine, and it's released in 1993. In 1994, Merkel was hoping to reach 500 motorcycles, which would be the break-even point. He also hires technicians from EML and starts many projects, such as a 125 that's never completed. He also started looking at using four-stroke and two-stroke Rotax engines, of which he does release a four-stroke version. He develops a dual-cylinder 320 640cc sidecar engine. However, since these engines are assembled by hand and he's not appropriately staffed, they only develop 10 units. This is the photo of the last Maker Factory rider in 1994, Brian Wells. Other riders who rode in the 1990s were Stuart Cole and Gene Bribes. Overall, though, very few blue Makos were made, and very few were imported to the U.S. This is why certain parts specific to the blue Makos could not be found, such as seat covers, gas tanks, and side panels. Finally, in 1995, a lot of money invested but no return, so they are now considering to sell Mako. Remco Denner, a machinist from the Netherlands, buys Mako and production moves to the Netherlands. This only lasts a few months though, and Jacob's Trade Dutch Group takes up ownership at the end of 1996. In 1987, Jacob's Trade was found to be a fraud, and the ownership returns back to Remco Demmer, also known as the Rodham Company. They are positioning Mako to make a comeback, and they release information of the new models to dirt bike magazines. In 1998, Mako Motorcycles NV declared bankruptcy. In 1999, BRM Sport, represented by Mr. Brower, bought Mako and continued production on a small scale, but they stopped production by 2000, and at that time they claimed they'd restart, but they never do. Axel Collister buys new old stock and toolings from Mr. Brower and starts assembling engines on a small scale, which continues to this day. In 2003, Collister had sponsored a supermoto team, and the Mako 500 was not powerful enough. So with the help of the late Herman Wallenbach, also known as Hugh of Power, he develops the Mako 620 and 685, which later became known on the internet as the Mako 700. In 2008-2009, a new company called Mako International appears and starts to promote Mako. They are putting new graphics on machines and looking at developing new components. This is when the Mako 700 really takes off on the internet. Originally, Mako International was positioning themselves as a distributor that would bolt on new components onto bikes built by Kostler. Eventually, a falling out between them led to Mako International to branch out on their own and manufacture their own bikes. They had several prototypes, but various issues prevented them from going production and imported them into the U.S. They had teamed up with Rich Wrinkler originally to import the bikes into the U.S. In 2011, Canadian Mako John Codwell had trademarked the defunct Mako logo and was going after Mako dealers as selling counterfeit parts. 
He rented royalties from Mako suppliers. This led to a lawsuit between him and Gary Colts of South Cal Mako, and eventually ended with the case being thrown out of court and the trademark registration on its way to be revoked by the courts. During this time, Mako International changed their name to avoid any further complications to Berkeley VLN. The current state of affairs at Berkeley VLN is unknown. Mako International did have success in racing newer Makos with writer Neil Barry in European and British two-stroke events with podium finishes. Today, you can still buy a Mako 250, 320, 500, 620, 685, aka Mako 700, from Kostler in Germany for the same price as a new bike, including shipping and import fees. Kostler owns a large KTM dealership and is very active with KTM. However, it should be stated that there is no direct affiliation between KTM as a corporation and Mako or the bikes being produced by Kostler. Some seem to think that Mako is owned by KTM or that KTM is producing these bikes, but these are the sole production of Kostler. Kostler also manufactures new parts and has a large selection of new old, Mako star, uh, new old stock parts for Makos. He is capable of building new reproductions of, of older engines, so if you wanted a new 1984 air-cooled Mako 500, he could build it for you. Some notable changes throughout the years. In 1986, a power valve was added to the 250, and in 1987, it was added to the 500. In 1992, the 500 became a true 500 instead of just a 490 with a 500 name extending the stroke to 85 millimeter from 83 millimeter. The same connecting rod is used from 83 and up. The 81, 82 models use a rod that is not as wide. Water cooling also changed in the mid 1990s, with the early mid 1990s, probably around 94, um, such that the coolant goes through both radiators instead of being split between two radiators. And finally, in 1999, a hydraulic clutch was added. Front disc brakes were added in 1985 and rear in 1986. So where does it bring us today? There is even an electric Mikko being built by another engineering company with several models, including models being designed with safety features for kids. There's also an event called Mikko Days, where every year in Germany, people gather their Mikko cars, motorcycles, and scooters to talk about Mikko or even sell Mikkos. <laughs> So what happened to the Mahish brothers? Well, 
In 2010, the Mace brothers joined another engineering dynasty, Manisman, to form Mako Manisman, which is a general engineering company. The brothers did have a wish to bring back the development of motorcycles, and in 2012, they released these electric scooters. Today, Mako parts are still being reproduced by many companies. There are a lot of parts that are similar across the years. For example, from 85 and up, many parts cross over. Vintage racing is still very popular with Makos, and Makos are still being raced today. There is even a timber sled Mako 700 that is being raced in snow hill climb events with podium placement. If you enjoyed this documentary, you may enjoy some of these other documentaries. The History of the Mako 700, Zabel, Mako, and the HTK Intimidator. Brad Lackey at Mako Motorcycles. Mako Motorcycles, Dirt Bikes, and Movies and TV Shows. The Top 10 Mako Motorcycles, Dirt Bikes You May Never Have Heard Of. So roll the credits. So while the credits roll, we can go over my dirt bike collection here. I have collected some Makos, a couple of them. So, also, some people may have seen some of the racers in this movie. I try to focus more on people who are more unknown. So, I mean, Ake Johnson, for example, is not unknown back in the 70s. But today, people probably know more of Danny Moo Chandler than... Him and then the Chandler, most of his races weren't run on one on a Mako. I mean, A. Johnson won two of his three motocross his nations on a Mako. So, and Rex Stratton, stuff like that. So, these people are people who possibly can get their own history. People want to hear like the history of A. Johnson, a history of you know, some of the racers or whatever. You know, that the, they may be a future video. So I may have an individual focused one, but for this general um, overall movie from start to finish of Mako, it's focused more on Mako with some highlights. So <clears throat> so let's go over my collection here. Come over here. Let's start down here. This Honda, there we always see, is not my bike. This is a neighbor's bike. So this is a pink Mako. No, just kidding. So this is the 1981 Mako 490. Mine is 1981 Mako 490. And it is a GS. It's good for trails. They put stickers on it. But I need to also get the timing out, but I was doing timing uh, as an air lake or something. It's also got Rage Racing special tuned $1,500 shocks on it or whatever. This one has Fox, a Fox Racing shock on it and I have another shock in there as well. I forget what, what the other one is. The other one's Fox Rollins or this one's Fox Rollins. I think this one's Fox though. So, this is 1982 Mega 490. That's not day two, maybe before I need rebuilt. Okay. This is a 2004 Mako 620. With custom graphics and everything. I need to fix the fan, that's why that's off. Okay. Next bike. 1986 Mako 500. And as you can see, like I had mentioned, that these had the Mako names ground off the case. <clears throat> but in there, I do have 
for these other bikes over here, those two have some new side cases, and I also have another new one coming for that one down there. But this is a 2004 Mako 500. It needs the shocks done, that's why it's sitting here, so they do the shocks on that one. Another 4 Mako 500. 700, 685, 2015 Mako 700 or 685cc. Needs cleaned, I haven't cleaned it yet. The 1983 Mako 490. Same spider. Disc brakes on it though. And the 5 speed. It used to be a 4 speed, that's a 5 speed from 84. 1985 Mako 500 water cold. And again, I have a side case cut for this one. Or did I already get it? No, I think I have a side case. But yeah, you can see the grand name off. Sidecar engine, Mako 660, 2004. Um, 1990s sidecar engine with 2004 500 frame. So that needs the exhaust taken off and redone, rehooked up with a seal. 1996 Mako 440, the rare 440 that is being built. It's the only one I have right now with that going in the tire. And you can see in here, it will say there ends Merkel right there. And then you have Air Cold 1985 Mega 500. 1983 Mega 500. This says, of course, Zabel 700. I'm building KTM 500, which I'm getting rid of. And there's a, K a Mako 500 engine. And in there I have a Mako 490 engine as well, 83. I have two of them, actually. And then up here, there's an exhaust. This up here, this is an 83 frame. So yeah, that's the collection here while you see the credits go up. You can see my array of pistons here and two times my bikes were entered. It shows.